Okay, so it's uh, 11.15, it's about time we start. Before we begin, a couple of uh, uh, announcements. There's a, no, I don't think every one of the, of the ladies at the conference uh, managed to place the proper shirt in the, um, in the, on the website. So that means that you might not have been invited to the Pi Ladies uh, event tonight. So if you want to participate to the Pi Ladies event and you are a lady, then <laughs> go to the... <laughs> <laughs> and the se second, uh, second and third are, if you, if, uh, you probably have uh, your badges about the uh, cocktails events every, every evening. If you are not available for that cocktail event, uh, please go to the registration and return the badge because we don't have a ton of those and there's still plenty of pie, uh, pizza lunch uh, badges that you can uh, access at the registration and without further ado Armin managed to open the door of his room this year and, <laughs> and come to the conference <laughs> <laughs> he's the author of Flask and uh, Werkzug is that how it's pronounced? No, close enough close enough yeah okay <laughs> All right, hello, good morning, uh, if it's the morning. Um, this talk is Thinking Outside the Box, as the title says, and again, with a lot of talks I do, it, like I come up with the topic before, with a rough idea of what it's going to be, and then whenever I submit a talk, and then making the content later on is always a little bit of a challenge, because the title is already there. So um, the, uh, the, the whole purpose of the talk is a little bit of uh, my last one and a half years working in a completely different industry from what I did before. Uh, I work for a London-based gaming company, and we do some sort of things that have to do with computers, um, uh, with computer games. Basically, we connect players together through online infrastructure. Uh, basically, we do internet for shooter games. Um, so what motivated me to this talk? Uh, basically, if you work in a certain field for a really long time, you start seeing sort of the border, and you always only work within that little box you operate in. Uh, basically, you, you start to be really comfortable with what you do and you stop exploring what's outside. And that is really, really dangerous. And in many ways, this is going to be a little bit of a cliche topic. Uh, and what better way to start this with actually showing the nine dots puzzle? Who, does, who knows the nine dots puzzle? Not that many people, apparently. Maybe you recognize it now. Basically, uh, you have nine dots, uh, you, and the, the, the purpose of this is you connect the dots within four straight lines and no retracing, so you can't go back on a line, uh, and you're not allowed to remove the pen from the paper. Um, this is the prime example of thinking outside the box, because basically the solution is you draw outside the box, and I think that is quite a nice way to visualize it, and it's incredibly cliche. Um, when I sort of talked to a bunch of people before I did the talk, like, couldn't you have picked a more generic topic that has been sort of, um, in many ways, like, beaten to death? And basically, um, that's true. Uh, there is there is a lot of, like, what is thinking outside the box? You, you sort of expect this is, uh, like, everybody say, like, you have to think outside the box, but what exactly does it mean? Um, there is uh, there's another very cliche thing, which is the six thinking hats. Who knows that? It's some sort of, I don't actually know how it works. Uh, it's basically some sort of, I guess, group therapy of, of how to do lateral thinking, like how to force yourself to think differently. Basically, you, s you take your thinking process and you break it into individual hats, and everybody takes a hat, I guess, at random, and, and then symbolizes what, what the hat is. So there are six hats. Um, there's the white hat, which is the information hat, and then there's the blue hat, which is some sort of group leader. And basically, all of your thinking processes, you start thinking as your hat symbolizes. So the, the white hat says only information. It never, it never ever says anything about if it's good or bad. Um, then there's the red hat, which is purely your emotions. Um, so you, you, you just, whatever first thought comes to your mind, you shout it into the room. Um, and then there's an optimistic hat, which is the yellow one, and that only says n the nice things. And it's sort of, it's, it, the idea is like it forces people to, um, to, to break up the thinking process as a team and then hopefully come up with new solutions. And the sixth thinking hat is, um, is, is, is this one. It's the black one. It's basically a person's always, always only pessimistic. Um, it, it only mentions the things that don't work. Um, there is, uh, this is when you go through thinking outside the box, 
this is one of the things that Wikipedia recommends is doing. You just assume that everybody's wrong all the time. Um, has anyone of you watched by any chance the South Park episode Getting Old? Uh, it's an episode where Stan, I think, turns 11 or something, and he only sees the negative things in everything anymore. Like he goes to the cinema and he only sees, oh, this is a rehash of a movie he saw 10 years ago or something. I, th that sort of thinking, and, and th then the, the doctor in, uh, in, in that episode um, diagnoses him as a cynical asshole. Um, and that is exactly what what's happens if you start doing this way too much. Like you, you, you look at the problem and you say, like, this is wrong. I, I know it, how, how it works differently. So th you can definitely overdo this whole thing. All right, but that's not entirely the point of the talk. Like, but that's sort of just keep in mind, you can absolutely overdo this. Uh, but I think it's important to, to always like, be a little bit critic uh, cr have a little bit of criticism to, to different topics. All right, so how do you think outside the box? In my case, the, uh, the nice thing is, one and a half years ago, I started working for a gaming company, and that was something I didn't really think I would be doing. So I was sort of presented with a completely new environment. And then as you start working in a completely new environment, a whole bunch of new things come up. So this is what uh, my workday looks like. Uh, the gray one is everybody else, and the green one is for people doing Python. So uh, it's not a very scientific graph because I don't actually know how many people op work in this, in this gray area. But overall, green is Python, gray is C++ and Unreal Script. And when, you s when you're in this whole environment for three months, you realize how quickly community influences your thinking. For a start, this is what the gaming industry thinks. C++ is good, scripting languages are bad. And why? Because actually it takes you 30 minutes to do a one-line change in the game, not because of C++, because a whole bunch of other reasons. And if it takes you 30 minutes, and I'm not joking, that's not a number that is raised for like presentation purposes. It takes you 30 minutes to do a one-line code change, no matter where. And because that's sort of the uh, agility the industry works with in many cases, Everybody is absolutely freaked out of a compiler not finding an error really quickly. Because the last thing you want to see is you run your game and, oh, you, I don't know, you, you assume an integer where a string is present. So th that's why the industry hates scripting languages, not because they're slow. Um, and if, if, that's your mind, if that's your model of mind, like it takes you 30 minutes to do a single change, then obviously that's going to affect everything. So it's very easy to dismiss something because of fringe experience or because of outdated experience. A lot of people just are sort of stuck 10 years ago in the gaming industry and haven't really noticed that dynamic languages have, have greatly improved. Um, so never underestimate how much your environment and community influences you. And I think in the Python community we have a similar problem, which is the gill is not a problem. I just had to make a little bit of a note there because very often you bring up the gill as a sort of discussion topic and people say, oh, it's not a problem because I don't have it. Yeah, because a lot of us are web developers. And for us, the gill is not a problem. We just have a lot of these Python processes running around. They're perfectly fine. But if you talk to a game developer, they will tell you that the fact that they only can have one core in a console happy with a Python interpreter and you can only have one interpreter running in one process space, there's a problem for them. So they just moved on and no longer care about this. Um, so this is, this is a little bit of a just sort of keep in mind kind of thing. You, the way you think is always influenced by everything around you. And in regards to Gil, my phone has four cores. I can only utilize, if I would use Python on my phone, I can only make one core happy. So I, my, my cores in the phone are not getting faster. So I will have more cores, but there is only ever one that Python can use. So that's, that's the kind of thing that sort of, uh, where, where, like, the people around you hugely influence what you do. Um, so in, in regards to thinking outside the box, I think a very important one is asking the right questions. And seeing the wrong questions is very easy on other people. So one of the things I really like doing is just help out people in IRC and, and see what problems they run into. And that is an example for me of, of asking the absolutely wrong question. Um, some user asked uh, on the Puku IRC channel, how to do something after return render template if he doesn't want to register tiered on request for, uh, handlers for all requests. So if you're not using Flask, that question doesn't make much sense. But basically, there are, there are two functions. One of them is render template, which as the name suggests, renders the template. And then there's a tiered on request callback thing 
which basically fires execution after the request. So when the request tears down, basically. Um, what, what does this user actually want to do? Um, so turns out what he actually wanted was a message screw. Like that was, that was his solution. Um, but if you read the question as a developer, like from my perspective, it looked like his, the first expectation is he wants to modify the HTTP response that comes back. Because one of the things you can do with such a teardown function, you take the, the, the response that goes to the browser and you can modify it um, or, or handle errors. Uh, and then if you look closer, and if, if I would start thinking down that path, very clearly teardown request wouldn't actually solve his problem because even, even if that was the question, that was not the problem because teardown request cannot actually modify response. So the question didn't lead anywhere. Uh, in fact, it, it leads down the wrong path. The better question would have been, I don't want my user to wait while I do processing of his data because that was what he actually wanted to do. His problem was not that he already decided the teardown function or, or something with render template is the solution to his problem. Actually, what his question should have been is, I don't want my user to wait while I crunch through 120 max of his like, uploaded file. And the box of thinking here was Flask, because within Flask, he would have never ever found the solution. Flask cannot do background execution. You have to go outside there. You have to find Celery or something else. And if, if Flask is not your box, then Whiskey might be the box. So by asking the, the actual question, like describing the actual problem, I, I can help him come up with a solution by already deciding that the solution is somewhere within Flask, that would no longer be possible. So how do you actually ask the right questions? And that's really hard because it's much easier to see that someone else, like after the fact, just asked something completely wrong or misleading. But how do you actually see yourself asking the wrong question? And one of the easiest one is just assume you're already wrong and just describe the actual problem. If you already think you have a solution, just keep it for yourself, never mention it and still ask like as if you have no idea what you're doing. Um, for instance, how do I do WebSockets Flask? Wrong question. Right question is, how do I notify my users without the lowest latency? How do I make an update on the user, uh, on the, in the user's browser? Don't even mention that WebSockets might be something you want to have in mind because the question now leaves a lot of room for the answer. It, the answer no longer might be WebSockets have to do anything with it because WebSockets don't have to be the solution for this particular problem. How many of you are web developers? Just a very basic show of hands. Uh, it is a little bit less than, no, it's actually more than less than 50%, which is quite nice because it means we have a diverse community. But one of the things that the web developers very often um, want to do is like they want to update the user interface as quickly as possible. And the solution that everybody knows is WebSockets because that's just like, it's a, it's a socket, so it does stuff. And it's web, so clearly. <laughs> but actually, there is so much more you can do. There, there are service sent events, which is basically just, you keep an HTTP connection open and you send stuff into it. And you don't have to send all the time, you just keep the connection open, you don't send anything until you have data ready and then you do send stuff. And that is one possible solution. Or you don't even have to use your favorite Python framework to do this update. You can use something else entirely. You can have a completely separate server and then use Redis or CRMQ or anything else to talk to that server. Like there is so much flexibility you have in this whole thing. And especially in regards to point B, I strongly recommend going to bit.ly slash pypush it's an article written by Sergey Koval about how to do scalable real-time infrastructure in Python. And it has nothing to do with any of your frameworks. It's basically just describing the actual problem and then going quite far with laying out how to probably, like how you could design something and looking at the actual problem, not at a very specific implementation. And generally jump on IRC and help out people because seeing other people fail gives you a ridiculous amount of understanding of of where you might be failing yourself. And it's not just asking questions, it's also questioning other people, like what other people do or what you do yourself. They, um, by far, the worst parts in all of my libraries are where I took the design from somewhere else. And it's not because I know better. It's because pretty much everything everybody does at any point in time has some sort of design decision behind it that made the decision process. So someone came up with a, with a solution for a particular problem and he thought about it and then wrote it down. But if you look at someone else's design, you might no longer understand why the decision was made in the first place. And in fact, if the original implementation is 10 years old, who knows if the design ideas behind it are still entirely correct. Um, 
I had this thing recently where I ported a library to Python 3, and I had to reevaluate a whole bunch of my internal APIs because basically they, they broke anyway, so I have to now go through them and fix them individually. And it turns out that the whole bunch of the decisions I made in my library were just wrong to begin with. Um, for instance, I based the cookie parsing on a standard library's cookie module, as I think most frameworks out there are doing. And, and for different reasons, that approach no longer works in Python 3. So I actually had to go in there and rewrite the cookie module. And then for the first time, I realized that my, the number of hacks I put on top of the cookie module from the standard library is larger than the re-implementation of the whole specification. Why? Because the standard library cookie module does so many more things that are absolutely no longer appropriate. For starters, it implements things that a browser never supported. It can emit JavaScript, which I don't think anyone ever used. Um, it can act both as a client and as a server, which for a whiskey framework is a little bit useless, especially considering that for the client part, the standard library's cookie module turned out to be absolutely useless, so they wrote a second one called cookie char, which is actually what solves the problem. So th this whole chain of, of like decision-making process in the past no longer in any way applies for it. And there is, I think there's another really sad example in the Python community of how we completely lost track of someone else's design process, which is the whole Python packaging thing. Um, so we had this utils at one point, which just executes a compiler, makes it tarball, and, and off you go. And then PGE wrote setup tools, and setup tools expanded on top of this whole distutils thing with a lot of monkey patching, and it made a system to distribute Python packages. And one of the things it does, or did at one point, it created these eggs. Does anyone remember eggs? Not that many people, that's interesting. So eggs are basically uh, a zip file. But they are a zip file that don't contain, by definition, they don't contain Python code, they, they primarily contain compiled Python code. And as a side effect, it means your egg is bound to a version number. Um, and over the years, people got really offended with these eggs because the maintainer of a library stopped supporting the library. So the egg you downloaded from PyPI stopped supporting at Python 2.5. So the, this whole egg thing just was a, a little bit complicated uh, because of lack of binary stability and a whole bunch of other reasons. But the solution was, was when distutils2, distribute pip, you name all of these tools came around to just no longer care about these X. And we, we completely forgot why the X were there in the first place. And the reason the X were really useful is Windows support. Because on Windows, you don't have a compiler. Well, you, you might have a compiler, but the average Python developer on Windows does not have a compiler. And even if you have a compiler on Windows, it doesn't work all that well. So we, we kind of made Windows support on, for, for Python a little bit more complicated for people. And, and now we, we sort of re-figured uh, re, re out what the problem was, and now we have a new specification called the wheel, um, which reinvents the wheel, I guess. But it basically <laughs> is X done better. And it's a really good approach. I, I think everybody should start supporting the wheel format. But it, it took us like, we had this like down curve of four, five years where we sort of completely forgot that there was an original intention for X that was not to annoy Python developers. So if you start something new, just question everything, but not with the intention of proving it wrong, but with the intention of understanding why design decisions have been made. And, and th that mindset is important, because if you start out just thinking you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, then you just will start believing it. But when you start out just thinking that I want to understand it, so if it helps me to say you're wrong, to just go down that route, then all, all the better. And the one thing, you, you, you automatically walk into is that as people think outside the box, you end up with this paradigm shift where all of a sudden everybody does it. And the, it's common, everybody immediately understands this is always how we did things. Um, no Python programmer that does web development does the PHP echo way, like where you just print things all the time until you have a response. Python, since the dawn of time, has request response objects, which it got from I believe Java probably, or whoever came up with it first. But for a Python developer nowadays, it's impossible to think that you write a standard output and that's where your, where your response goes. We have an abstraction layer in there and everybody just assumes it's there. Every Python programmer takes an interactive interpreter for granted because it just started up. And when I started playing around in Rust, I was absolutely shocked that there is none. And then someone wrote it because the expectation of the community is that there has to be an interactive interpreter. And 
even though Rust is a compiled language, they have an inter interactive interpreter. And at one point, this whole concept of running code as it goes uh, was not all that popular. Like, obviously, it was there initially when BASIC was around. But still, this whole thing of having an interactive interpreter for a C++ programmer is just, this doesn't make any sense. But for Python, it's something we take for granted. And, and that's what makes it really hard to find examples. Because from, if I want to find examples now of where someone thought outside the box, it, it's really hard. Because the good ones are the ones everybody already understands anyways. So basically, my, my, the biggest point I can make of thinking outside the box is that every idea is a rehash. And the only thing is you take an example from one community and you transpose it to somewhere else. Uh, so if I bring up some examples, don't get too excited if you say it's like obviously, because that kind of, that's kind of the point. So the last part of this is basically a, a collection of really interesting examples. And they don't have to be really good examples, but I, I found them interesting, of people just thinking in very bizarre ways to, to so explore a new area. Um, and one of them is the mill processor. I don't know if anyone has seen this thing on Hacker News a couple of weeks ago. Does, did anyone hear of the mill processor? Perfect. I have something to talk about. So <laughs> it's, um, I have to go a little bit further there. But it's basically a CPU. And the one thing with a CPU is it, it does three things all the time. It decodes an instruction. So it, it has a, bit, a block of memory. And in that block of memory, there is execution instructions it has to execute. And then some other part of the memory is being used to store your data. Basically, your CPU all the time just linearly walks through this thing until it decides to, it decodes an instruction, executes the instruction, fetches some memory, all that stuff. And then eventually, it will jump somewhere else and execute some different code. That's basically what it does. It linearly runs through this whole address space. And because it needs to do a whole bunch of things, um, people constantly try to make this whole execution process more efficient. And the, the, the approach the middle processor sort of takes is absolutely bizarre. They basically decided to treat memory as a two-dimensional thing. And they have, instead of one instruction pointer going forward, they have two instruction pointers going apart. Uh, so basically, and the reason why this works is because they figured out that a compiler already makes an assumption about how it compiles code, which is there is a concept of a basic block. And it's basically, the definition of a basic block is there is one entry point, there is one exit point. You cannot jump in the middle of a basic block, and you cannot jump out of the middle from a basic block. That's, that's, that's a fundamental part of how a compiler works. It, that's, that's why it starts optimizing things. So basically, they decided to break that bundle into half and jump in the middle of it and then run apart. Every time they jump, they jump to a new address, and then from that address, one instruction pointer goes to the right, the other one goes to the left. It's, it's bizarre. And Clearly, it works, at least on the paper. I, I don't think they actually made this processor already. But that someone actually went this far and figured out that because this, cons this, in, uh, this restriction is in place, you can double your decode performance. And you can double your cache utilization because none of these, like the left decoder and the right decoder, you can decode completely independent resources and have their own instruction cache. That I find absolutely like, impressive to even go that far. And that's, that's an impressive example of just thinking with the constraints given, how far can I actually go? Um, another example I, I'm absolutely obsessed with is this concept of high-level queues for request handling. So traditionally, a web application takes a request, and it's connected to a socket and goes to the web server. And then a web server handles it and sends through the socket the request back to the browser. That's, like, that's how everybody does it. But what if you actually go further, and instead of handling this whole request chain in one go, you take a request, put it in a task queue, and let, let the worker pick it up. And when a worker is happy with it, it puts the response back on the task queue and sends it out to the front end. One of the things you immediately get from it is all of your worker code is entirely um, stateless, as it was before. But you can transparently shut down your worker processes and restart them. And you will never, ever lose a single request. Because the worst thing that happens, all of your requests are sitting on that queue. And nobody consumes them because all of your workers are around. If a worker comes up again, it starts picking up the, the request. Best part is 100% utilization of your system infrastructure. Because when a worker is happy picking up a process, it means it has all the resources available. And with that, you can also do even more impressive things. Like all of your WebSocket connections are terminated at the front end server. If you write something in a WebSocket connection, a worker picks it up, worker sends it back in. You can do a code deploy without terminating your WebSocket connections. That stuff is really, really useful. Um, 
but it's that this that the fact that you can stop treating a request response as if it was a socket connection that requires a little bit like thinking of well because everybody does it there must be a reason for it yeah, there's a little bit of a reason for it but it, it actually turns out you can just ignore that everybody does it and try a different approach and it still works and it gives you advantages um, another thing that basically blew my mind a really long time ago was that there is this, this concept of cookies are horrible. They cannot use cookies for storing information in it because a user can modify the cookie at any point in time. That's correct. Like an HDB cookie is sent around and the browser keeps it. So you cannot trust that the cookie's value is, is secure. But one thing you can do is you can have a secret on the server side. You sign your cookie and now unless you have the secret, nobody can modify the cookie. Like you apply crypto, uh, cryptography to your problem. And Turns out that's how every modern web framework has uh, does sessions, basically. Instead of storing it somewhere in the file system, you just have a secret key, you sign your cookie, it goes to the browser, and it comes back. Not a single database, like you don't have to go to your database to figure out what's in my cookie because it's being transmitted all the time anyways. And with, with that in mind, that you can actually apply a cryptography problem, uh, like a, a cryptographic solution sort of to a problem, you can start doing a whole bunch of things. For starters, because you have unlimited storage, basically, with this, uh, you, can, you can solve a bunch of problems in a much more interesting way. For instance, every time you authorize against an OAuth resource, you have to transmit some sort of credentials, like username and password, and what you get back is a token. And that token is valid for a certain number of, of hours. But the specification also gives you a second token, which is called the refresh token, which is a token you can use to refresh the other token. Now, if you have to store the refresh token all the time, it means that you have to re expire those tokens because as people are abusing your API, they will make more and more and more tokens. So when before we started like using a refresh token as if it was a signed cryptographic resource, we ended up with, I don't know, over Christmas, I think a couple of million refresh tokens in our database because it turns out the developers that made the front-end game never ever used that token. So they always created new access tokens. And with those access tokens, they would create more and more refresh tokens. And if you don't ever store the refresh token because cryptographically signed, like all of these problems go away. And, and that sort of change in thinking is, doesn't really come natural from first point. Um, another example, and that's not as much thinking outside the box, but is I think in my mind the, uh, the Rust programming language, which takes this idea of you can, you can track how memory walks, like how memory is owned at all times, uh, which basically means that you get all the advantages of C++'s memory management, which is you know when allocation happens, you know when this allocation happens, but because you can trace that there is only ever one owner of the block of memory, it becomes uh, a secure thing. Like when C++ it crashes if you access some random memory, Rust guarantees statically that that never happens. And nobody thought of this before, I believe. Like there, there might have been one or two research papers, but someone actually went in with this idea like can you make this work and then they started designing a program language around it and that is i think another really brilliant example of just trying a completely new approach and and the last one is um uh, it's one of my favorites uh is how spotify does its native web thing so i don't know if you've ever noticed but spotify has these pages where you can play a play button on the website and your native application starts playing music has anyone ever wondered how this is implemented? It's, it's really bizarre. Basically what they do, I don't know if they still do it, but for a really long time, Spotify used to run a local HTTP server on your computer that was hosted by your Spotify client, and the website was connecting to your local HTTP server, and then it was using HTTP to remote control your own computer. It's absolutely mental. One of the things they had to do for it is they had to register a domain that resolves to localhost so that they can, this, they can buy an SSL certificate for the domain and then embed the SSL certificate into their own client. I mean, so, like somewhere at Spotify, there must have been like this a brilliant mind that came up with this absolute bizarre hack. And it is, it is impressive. Like, I played around with it. I made a little thing where if you go to a website, it plays Rick Astley's um, Never Gonna Give You Up. It, like that stuff is fun. <laughs> and, and someone had to come up with this. Uh, in my mind, a really brilliant thing. All right, that's, that's basically it. Um, I would love to take a lot of questions and just uh, give answers to them.
is there an actual implementation of the request response queue stuff? There is. We have one. It's not open source. Um, the uh, there is one problem with this, which is um, so there. Are, I know a bunch of people do that. Um, Braintree is a company I know does it. Um, they call it Broxy, which is like a, a proxy for Braintree transactions. And they basically put all of their transactions on a Redis queue, all of the requests on a Redis queue, and then just pop it off and, and do stuff with it, and then put it back. So they have a, a blog post somewhere where they like explain how they did the data migration from one data center to the other one without losing a single transaction, which is pretty impressive, uh, and no downtime. It was just really slow for the meantime. Um, we have one for our game stuff. I think Demonware does something similar for what they do. The problem with that one is that in order to make it somewhat performant, you have to make trade-offs somewhere. Uh, like you have to limit the size of what you actually put on the queue. Because if someone sends you an HDB request of 100 megabytes, you don't want to put 100 megabytes on your queue. So the way we deal with this is we, uh, we, we, we define our endpoints. Um, like what data does it take? Like there is the, Basically, we know what data we expect, expect for any single endpoint, and then we, we verify that the data roughly corresponds to that. And then when we have, when we are happy with the data, we, we take all the HTTP stuff away and put it in the queue. But that is very specific for how it works for us, because we're basically just an API. Um, so we could probably take our stuff and make eventually an open source library out of it, but we haven't really discovered yet what, like, what our best practices for this would be. Um, so that's, our stuff is not open source for that reason. Um, but I, I believe that's one of the things we will probably see much more common in, in the future. Because from a pure load balancing point of view, having both request response things and WebSocket connections, like they have very different load patterns. So from a pure load balancing point of view, it's very interesting to just uh, try this. Um, I looked around a little bit before. As far as I know, there is not an open source implementation for it. That being said, there is Mongrel 2, which is a set uh HTTP server thing, which uses zero MQ messages between the server and the backend process, which is basically a task queue. Um, but it's, it, like, as the name says, it's not really a queue. It just behaves like one. Um, so with zero MQ, you have this theoretical problem that you still lose some messages, and it's a quite a pain to debug from my experience. But uh, uh, Mongrel 2 is a BC or MIT license or something, and uh, that is definitely there. You can use it with Python if you want. Uh, but it's, it's not a real queue thing. Do you also do control, control flow on, uh, on all of these uh, queues? Because if, if a queue starts to fill up with, uh, with requests because your workers are starting to be slow, then you might run out of memory or uh, the well, the anything thing, might happen there. The thing there is that you already have it. Even in the absence of a task queue, you still have a socket queue. So that problem was always there. It's just that your Nginx web server or whatever you use for load balancing, usually, so if they, I, there are only n connections I can handle afterwards, it just doesn't accept the connection anymore and say, off you go. So you can can still do that with a task queue. It's just say like if my queue fills up, uh, gateway unresponsive or something. And you discard uh, with uh, time to live uh, all of the messages that come no, into the queue? No, you keep the messages in, you just don't accept any new ones. No, but, uh, but when you start reprocessing again, the first message might be half an hour old. Yeah, if you, if you end up with a situation where you have an item on the task queue that is, that is now for a resource that disconnected, like a socket went away, yeah, it's uh, just throw it away. Uh, in our case, if it pops off the task, um, it, there's a very basic time to live on it, and if that is more than 10 seconds old, it just throws it away. But there is no TTL on the actual record. Any more questions? Nope. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you.